Well, thanks for coming out today. This is always, uh, I think, the best part of what we can do is talk to everybody that works here at Johnson Space Center, our uh, family and friends, uh, because this is where really all our a major portion of the work is accomplished for space shuttle flight. And uh, we are happy to be here to tell you a little bit about it through our movie and slides. Before I do that, let me go ahead and introduce the crew real briefly. On my right is Terry Wilcutt, the pilot. Terry was a Marine Corps pilot and uh, was from Kentucky, ended up being the first Kentuckian to fly in space. Next to him is Tom Jones, our payload commander. Um, Tom flew on 59, uh, the first flight of SRL, as you know, and uh, was a very valuable member of our crew on this flight. Steve Smith is next to him. Steve was MS-1. Uh, he flew on his first space flight. Next to Steve is Dan Bursch. He's on his second flight. He flew as MS-2, our flight engineer. And on the end is Jeff Weisoff, who also flew his second flight on uh, SRL-2 uh, as MS-3. And uh, with that, we'll just go ahead and start our movie, and uh, we'll narrate it as it goes. The shuttle sitting out on the launch pad the night during the nighttime as we're sleeping and getting ready, or some of us were sleeping. I guess the blue shift was up and about. Uh, they woke the red shift up about five hours before launch, which is fairly standard. Uh, we went in to have some breakfast, we went to a weather briefing, and then immediately uh, went in to get our suits on. Of course, in the suit room, we checked the uh, suits for pressure integrity. There's Terry again. Tom, and he's the one in the orange suit. <laughs> Steve and Dan and Jeff. And of course, we uh, take off from the crew quarters, the fairly standard scene, I guess, jump on the astro van and head out to the pad where we get on board about two and a half hours before launch. You'll see in just a second uh, the water deluge coming down, and the engine starting, and this time starting for good. Uh, a little twang, and again, the, when the solid rocket motors uh, ignite, you're going uh, out of town very quickly. It was a beautiful launch, felt great uh, on board. We jumped right up to two and a half Gs, did our roll maneuver, throttled down, uh, and had a very, uh, I guess, nominal ascent. No uh, failures of any sort, it was very nice. Yes, yes, and, and the expression uh, "we were kicked off the pad" is a is an accurate one. Here's a pretty spectacular view of us penetrating a, a cloud layer. During our ascent, you can see the reflection off the clouds, and the dark line off to the left there is, uh, of course, the shadow from our exhaust plume. It took us eight and a half minutes to get to space. Uh, here come the sawed rockets being kicked off the ET. If you watch carefully, you can see their exhaust uh, tail off. And eight and a half minutes later, after liftoff, of course, we get rid of the ET tank and we're in space. Next, we got the payload bay doors open, and uh, Steve opened them up, and Dan took these pictures. Uh, you can see the port door going open, and it exposes the cargo bay and the space radar lab to uh, Earth for the first time. And the large slab side of antenna is visible on the left. That's Sir C. XR is the tilted, folded segment up against its upper right corner. And the MAPS carbon monoxide pollution sensor is on the bridge structure at the forward end of the bay. Now inside, we were activating ourselves too. We got all our cameras out. We had 14 cameras to document the radar uh, science on board and the MAPS uh, pollution science. There was a large Linhoff mapping camera and I'm holding a Hasselblad uh, telephoto lens. We took about 14,000 shots to document the science on board. In addition to taking a lot of pictures, we changed out uh, tapes on board which recorded the data. Uh, this uh, radar puts out uh, enough information, it's like 45 TV channels broadcasting at once, and uh, by the end of the flight we had enough data that could have uh, equivalent to uh, floppy disks stacked up 15 mi miles high, so it was quite a quite amount of data that we brought back. One of the recorders uh, failed in flight, so we had to change it out. This is the failed recorder getting ready to be put back under the floor. Now the radar needed to be pointed uh, while we were up there in the right direction to all the, the uh, sites on the ground. Here I am typing in one of the 400 plus maneuvers that it took. Uh, each shift ended up doing about 11,000 keystrokes. This is a view that we didn't see too often. About every 24 hours we had to point the star trackers, which are located on the nose of the shuttle towards the stars, to align our inertial measurement units on board. And um, here we are coasting down uh, 
traveling southeast over uh, India, the west, west coast of India. Once we get the radar set up and ready to go, it's ready to start taking data. And the next scene that you're going to see is a picture of us passing over the Sahara Desert. As you can see that to the eye, it doesn't look very like there are many features. But when you turn the radar on, this is what the radar can see underneath the ground are ancient riverbeds. Uh, and that was part of our study. This was a geological site that we wanted to understand the history of how the Sahara Desert became what it is today, because obviously its climate in the past must have been very different to have these riverbeds underneath. Now, we were looking into Earth's past history here in the Sahara, but we also got a chance to see some of the dynamic geology going on on Earth. Uh, on launch day, the Klutchevskoy volcano erupted on, up on Kamchatka, and you can see the uh, ash and smoke plume going up over 50,000 feet here from this uh, nadir view. You can even make out the lava flows going down the uh, snow-covered sides of the volcano. And that ash plume was blown by the jet stream well out to the east, several hundred miles uh, downstream. And the, the sight of this uh, plume blowing downwind was really amazing each day when we came up over the horizon and saw this plume waiting for us over Kamchatka. And volcanoes were an important part of our uh, studies on board. We were looking at 15 dangerous ones around the world that endanger populated areas. After a snowfall, Klutchevskoy was uh, almost uh, pristine again. You couldn't even tell that it, it had erupted. But in our radar, radar data here, you can see uh, in this uh, false color image the ash colored in red on the mountain slopes and the lime green uh, lava flow that was freshly generated during our flight uh, coming down slope towards the uh, Kamchatka River Valley. And I had actually brought up a, a small volcanic rock on board to uh, give a little talk about our volcanic studies. And we hoped by unraveling the past eruptive histories of these mountains to tell you about the future hazards of them. Well, we worked uh, 24 hours uh, around the clock up there. And uh, this is uh, two out of the three people on the blue shift with uh, Tom on the left, uh, myself on the right, and Steve Smith um, is the one out of that uh, picture. Here we are coming over. Australia, it was clear, although uh, several fires, and we would point out these fires and, and indicate when there were fires so the MAPS instrument could correlate that to their measurements of carbon monoxide that they were making. Here we are coming over the Philippine Islands, and uh, this is three times normal speed, so we really don't go that fast. And um, you can see the reflections off the water. We can actually see several hundred feet beneath the surface because of what these internal waves do to the uh, surface of the water. You can't detect with the naked eye, but you can with the reflections. And uh, to con continue the blue team's um, explanation of what we saw here, I, I welcomed you to the rooftop of the world. That's the, what this area is called. This is Tibet. Uh, even the valleys in this area are 15 to 20,000 feet above sea level. This is one of the beautiful sights we saw. The blue team saw the earth lit from Europe all the way through New Zealand. This was always one of our personal favorites to see the uh, beautiful iceberg colored lakes up in uh, the Tibetan highlands. And you see off in the distance there is uh, the Himalayas, and past that is India. As Tom said, we took 14,000 pictures. It kept us very busy. It was uh, often a competition to get to any certain window. This is Dan looking out the commander's window. We were rolled slightly so the commander's window looked at Earth. It was always nice to be able to pass the cameras so easily. Uh, we always had time for uh, a little bit of fun as we prepared our meals here. This is uh, the way our meals were packed. This is uh, me bringing up the lunch tray here and uh, showing Tom and Dan what they could have. We often ate on the fly for lunch very quickly. Uh, we did have more time for dinner. Uh, before we went to sleep, we often went down downstairs, which we call the mid-deck. That's Dan eating dinner on the ceiling, uh, me on the left, and Tom doing a last-minute uh, film change before we went to sleep. Well, uh, everybody knows that uh, Mike Baker is so cool, calm, and collect, it's really hard to spin him up. So this is the only way i found on orbit to do it. Uh, behind us there, you see the uh, sleep bunks um, that we used. I couldn't quite get into it the same way that I learned as I was growing up. And uh, it takes a while to practice to do it without banging your head too much. But uh, it was nice to have those. And uh, Well, even though the shuttle was designed to be autonomous, you never can quite escape the ground. <laughs> and nor would we want to. This is how we started every shift. Uh, we'd get a new uh, attitude timeline, science timeline up from the ground and uh, changes to the flight plan. Like Dan said earlier, we had over 400 maneuvers we had to manually type in, and that equated to over 22,000 keystrokes. Every night pass, uh, which was half our time up there, we would spend uh, going over the flight plan, seeing what secondary activities we had to do, and also reviewing the, uh, our uh, onboard maps to study what land sites we were going to pass over. 
in this upcoming scene, you'll be able to tell that this is a California pass because you can watch our commander get ready to take pictures of his home state. And you see, you're getting fairly excited here because we're getting ready to go over California. This is San Francisco Bay Area, San Jose. See the Sacramento area here, the Central Valley of California. Down here at the very bottom of the screen is Monterey Bay. And right in here somewhere is Fresno and Lemoore is where I'm from. At the top you can see the snow-capped Sierra Nevada Mountains. And then pretty soon here you'll see this V is the San Andreas Fault and the Garlock Fault that come together right here. And right in there is Edwards uh, Lake Bed. And then you'll be able to see Los Angeles and uh, JPL, which is right in this area. San Diego right there. And at the top of the screen is the Salton Sea. And this uh, light brown area you see in there is a large plankton bloom, a large agri agricultural area in the Colorado River Basin, and the Colorado River Delta that opens up into uh, Baja. And of course, on the bottom of the screen is the uh, uh, Baja, California. And then you can see, as we look back over the uh, pass that we just made, you can see Baja extending off into the north. In addition to uh, passes down California that were spectacular, this is the Chesapeake Bay area. You can see Baltimore up here, and Washington is just going off the screen there. Here's uh, Potomac coming up uh, to the Washington area. This area is very important because it acts as a nursery for fish, and uh, one of our prime sites was to study uh, the Gulf Stream just off of the shore of uh, eastern Virginia. And as we pass down here, you can now see uh, Norfolk, Virginia, my hometown, and uh, Arbemel Sound, and down here is Cape Hatteras, and of course Kitty Hawk, where the great adventure started, is just down there. So this is a nice view looking south going off the coast, and uh, just off the coast here would be the Gulf Stream area, which we would study in Sunglint with our cameras. This is a picture of uh, South America looking uh, north along the Andes. This particular area here is what we used as kind of our visual aid in helping locate where we were. Coquimba, Chile is right uh, in that bite along the coast. And as you cross over the Andes here, it almost looks very three-dimensional. There were a number of mountains and volcanoes that were of interest as geology sites. In addition to our mission to planet Earth primary payloads, we also had several experiments in the crew cabin. Here I am setting up a 100-pound uh, chair, which is very easy to manipulate in space for a, a head and eye movement experiment. Here Terry has a laser mounted to his head, and he uh, and I both did this experiment where we moved the laser uh, to follow a target that was on the forward bulkhead. And again, it was to, to judge how well our eyes were working with our head movements. And we actually saw some degradation during space. That's the target on the forward bulkhead. We also had to do daily maintenance uh, to clean out filters. Uh, anything that's loose flying within the shuttle actually ends up on these filters as they draw the air to them. That's the commercial protein crystal growth experiment, uh, growing crystals of an anti-cancer drug. So we just use gray tape to clean all those filters every day. Well, here I am caught again playing with my food. <laughs> actually, if you'll watch this, you'll see some pretty interesting fluid dynamics. Of course, what I'm trying to do is keep that uh, tropical punch off my shirt. Success. <laughs> Here's an exercise period. Uh, Bakes and Jeff, if you look carefully, you'll notice that uh, Bakes is the only one with an ergometer. And here's Jeff with a uh, model of the Starship uh, Enterprise and also a model of the shuttle. He took these up there because he knew that was the only thing Bakes and I was going to let him fly. <laughs> well, here's uh, Terry and I coming up to the flight deck to get ready to do one of the uh, 14 uh, trim burns that we did for the interferometry data takes towards the end of the mission. Uh, Dan put together a nice procedure along with the help of the Fidos to uh, get these burns trimmed down to an unprecedented accuracy of about 0.05 feet per second for the Delta V goes. Uh, and we were able to successfully uh, perform those burns and get the orbiter to within 200 feet of where it was uh, the day before and also within 200 feet of where the Endeavour was in April on the first uh, flight of SRL. It's a pretty uh, remarkable feat, I think. This is an example of what the acceleration of, of the uh, plus X jets will do uh, to the folks on the mid-deck. We put together the images from last April and October over Long Valley, California, an old volcanic crater in California, to make this three-dimensional topographic map the whole objective of this interferometry experiment. And this, this is digital topography made from the radar. 
without any contour elevations from the ground. Now, the radar was uh, cooking throughout the whole 10 or 11 days of science, but eventually we started to run out of film. Here it is piling up, exposed in our uh, storage bags on board. And when we ran down out of film, the radar was also running down its investigations. There's Mike and Jeff waving goodbye from the crew cabin. And while the sun was setting on SRL, too, we were also getting ourselves set up to come back for uh, entry day, uh, hopefully to Florida, but we wound up in California. As you can see, we've turned our orbiting laboratory into uh, a reentry vehicle and also an airplane. Jeff, on the right there, there's a shot towards uh, Bakes. You see out the window the glow of the atmosphere as we start to reenter, and the hot plasma gases as they come over the uh, orbiter uh, periodically meet at overhead and, and cause bright flashes. There's looking over uh, Terry's shoulder on the right-hand side, the pilot, and uh, you see the uh, sunset there, and there's uh, Bakes flying. At this point, you know, we take over manually at about 50,000 feet overhead the uh, runway and uh, fly it around the heading alignment cone. And here you see us turning on the final just prior to doing our subsonic uh, DTO, our flight test. There's a little wing rock, which is about all the motion that you see out of the aileron doublet and uh, uh, yaw doublet that we did. We're coming down 18 degree glide path at 300 knots. At 2,000 feet, we performed the pre flare to reduce our glide path to about one and a half degrees. At 300 feet, Terry put the gear down. And we crossed the threshold at about uh, 235 knots and 35 feet. Looking for a touchdown at about 200. We touched down at 195, about one foot per second on the sink rate. And we were also doing the drag shoot flight test, so we put the shoot out immediately on uh, main gear touchdown. Uh, allowed it to fully deploy, and uh, from touchdown to the start of derotation was about 15 knots. Started the derotation, got the nose on the ground about 130 knots, and uh, started braking about 80 knots. And at 60 knots, you'll see in a second, we'll jettison the chute and came to a stop about 12,000 feet down the runway with 3,000 feet remaining. It's a great flying machine. Uh, it was a joy to fly on this mission to planet Earth, and it was uh, landing was a nice ending to a successful mission. Great landing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have. We now have uh, a set of slides to show you, and I guess uh, Tom, you can start off. Well, this is our uh, prime payload, uh, SRL two. And uh, you're probably familiar somewhat with it already from last spring's flight. The large uh, flat array of antennas is from the uh, sur -C, uh, element built by JPL, a synthetic aperture radar that includes both C and L band wavelengths. This uh, tilting uh, motorized portion up here is the X band antenna built by the German and Italian space agencies. And uh, both of these operated in concert at three different wavelengths to uh, scan the Earth's environment at the surface. And looking at the atmosphere forward, was the uh, MAPS experiment on its fourth space flight aboard the shuttle, measurement of air pol pollution from satellites, which was designed to track uh, sources and transport of carbon monoxide uh, around the planet. And it tells us about the carbon cycle and uh, the input of trace gases that might be uh, important to global warming. And uh, Langley Research Center built this experiment, and it operated very successfully. Next. Now inside, while the instruments were doing their uh, uh, tasks under ground command, the crew was operating all its cameras uh, full-time during the daylight passes. And here's Terry with uh, all four of our Hasselblad cameras, each of which had a, a lens of a different focal length or film type. And here's the large Linhoff mapping camera. We had two of those that were locked into our bracket uh, pointing where the radar was. So in many cases, when we didn't have field teams on the Earth's surface documenting the truth of the radar's data, we had the cameras on board providing that ground truth to the science teams. So we were an important source of uh, correlative or documentary information for the science to prove that the radar was giving accurate data to the scientists. Well, as Tom mentioned, uh, one of the important jobs we had was to try to document uh, what the radar was looking at. Uh, this is myself in one of the uh, aft overhead windows uh, getting ready to use two of our Hasselblad cameras. Just to give you a feel as we go through these slides of kind of what you're looking at, uh, this camera here with the 100 millimeter lens uh, typically had a field of view of about uh, 66 nautical miles, so when you see some of those, you'll get an idea of the scale, whereas this lens here with the 250 millimeter uh, would zoom in to about a 26 nautical mile um, radius that you're looking at. And so we use these, these cameras as well as a wider angle camera to, to document 
uh, most of the photographs. We also, as Tom mentioned, had a Linhof camera, which allowed us to get some uh, wider format pictures as well. Next slide, please. Well, of course, you've got to show your hometown. This is Norfolk, Virginia. Um, one reason for showing it is up here is Langley, which was uh, the sponsor of the MAPS instrument, which uh, worked uh, superbly all through the flight, monitoring the carbon monoxide around the world. Uh, right here, you can see the ship piers along the Norfolk Naval Base. And as you come in here, you go up to the James River. Uh, this is the Elizabeth River that comes down to downtown Norfolk. And then the Lafayette River scoots off to the side here. If you go on out into the Chesapeake Bay area, you round this corner, which is Cape Henry, you'll go out along the Virginia Beach area and out, of course, to one of our super sites that I mentioned earlier, which is the Gulf Stream. And uh, you could actually see the boundary of the Gulf Stream in the sun glint because there's a difference in the texture of the water that you can see uh, with the sun shining on it. Next slide, please. Well, this is a um, view of the northern part of the Chesapeake Bay area. Uh, you can see, of course, up here the Baltimore area. And as we come down from the Baltimore area, you can see the Annapolis area right in here, which I was told to mention by my commander. And of course, down here was Pax Rivers area, and you have Washington, D.C. up here along the Potomac. And off in the distance here, you can see the Blue Ridge Mountain area. So this is a really a nice, clear day in Virginia and, and uh, Maryland area. And as I mentioned earlier, this is, of course, a very important waterway. It's the home of the delicious blue crabs in the area, as well as a number of fish. And uh, it's important for the marine life in that area that these wetlands are protected. And we were studying uh, that entire uh, region with our instruments on board. Next slide, please. This uh, picture here is of uh, California. This is Mono Lake here. And Crowley Lake is a small lake here. And one of our backup uh, hydrology super sites was the Mammoth Mountain area, which is right here. Yosemite National Park is in the background here. Uh, you saw earlier the three-dimensional map that Tom talked about of the Long Valley area, and that was this ridge that extends along here. What happened was about 750,000 years ago, a volcano collapsed and created this depression. Now, one of the prime uh, science objectives near the end of our mission was to do what was called interferometry. The way to think about this is when we took our normal radar pictures during the early part of the flight, that measures elevation a lot like a policeman measures how fast your car is going. It bounces uh, radar waves off the ground and measures the time for the echo to come back. What interferometry does is it uses the same principles as those three-dimensional images you see on your credit cards called holograms. It actually interferes patterns of, of several multiple images, and you can use that to construct a three-dimensional image. Of course, here the challenge is we're trying to do it on a global scale as opposed to a small three-dimensional image that you see on your credit card. Next slide, please. This is actually a three-dimensional, um, this is a topographic map of that same area. This is Crowley Lake, the smaller lake that I showed you, and this is the ridge along here. And it's probably a little hard to see from your seats, but there are topographic lines on this map that show elevation changes for about every 50 feet of elevation change along that, that surface. Next slide, please. Well, there were two ways that we could actually do interferometry on our flight. One was to take images that were taken from the April flight, STS-59, and combine them with images taken from our flight. The other way, and that was how that previous map was made, the other way is to actually do um, passes over the same target within one flight. And that's what we did on the last few days of our flight, is we kept doing repeat orbits every 24 hours. This shows the data taken with the L-band part of the radar, which is 24 centimeters, and this shows uh, uh, a topographic uh, image taken with the C-band, which is six uh, centimeters. And what you'll notice is that the color changes are four times as fast for this one as for that. And that's because of the difference of four times in the wavelengths. So these images are basically the raw interference fringes taken from uh, this part of the world, and they can be processed into a topographic map at a later time. We talked about earlier, uh, this is the commander's window. Uh, most of the photography that we took in support of the uh, radar was out the overhead windows. The one Linhoff you saw on the bracket was in the right uh, aft window, and then the other window was used with <laughs> for handheld Hasselblad or Linhoff pictures. But the commander's window looked in the opposite direction um, than the radar did, so you were able to take other photographic uh, documentation of other things that uh, are general Earth OBS photography that's done on any flight. So that's kind of what we did out that window. And uh, we also took pictures of radar sites, uh, depending on whether we had nose forward or nose aft uh, going along our velocity vector, we may see uh, radar sites on a, on a different pass than when we were actually using the radar to image it. This is just a photo of the tile damage we received on the right aft Ohm's pod. And I think that, uh, that this was caused by the tile that came off the overhead window. 
uh, on launch. It's a shot of San Francisco Bay. We have to point out a few things here. Um, there's, I guess we'll start off with downtown San Francisco and the Golden Gate Park, uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, down south, we're just off the uh, slide of San Jose. There's San Francisco International Airport. This island is Alameda. Right in there is the Naval Air Station in Alameda. Uh, Oakland International Airport's over here. Uh, and here's Alcatraz Island and Angel Island and Sausalito. The other thing that's kind of interesting about this shot is you can see the San Andreas Fault that goes up here and extends across the bay up here. This is San Francisco at night. Uh, we had very nice uh, night passes over San Francisco. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we see most of the Earth, uh, or 50 percent of our time looking at the Earth is at night. And it's really a beautiful thing to see. And unfortunately, and unfortunately there's not really a good way to show you uh, what it looks like from Earth. It's very difficult to get good uh, photography uh, at night. But this one turned out OK. You can see the, uh, the bridges in the San Francisco Bay here. San Mateo Bridge, this is the Dumbarton Bridge. And this is downtown San Francisco with the lights, the bright lights. And you can see the Bay Bridge and a little bit of lights from uh, Treasure Island. And you can <coughs> see uh, the Golden Gate Bridge across there. This is a shot of uh, northwest uh, Canada, or actually south. It's just north of the uh, Washington-Idaho border inside of Canada. And it's very typical of the northwest part of uh, the country and of the hemisphere. Uh, and it's just an example of some of the things that we can see. You can see all these rectangular uh, areas that you see all throughout the picture are a clear cutting of logs and timber in the northwest. And it's the very same thing that we see in Washington and Oregon and in, in the U.S. Uh, and the radar is very valuable if we had a permanent one any, at any rate to uh, monitor these areas and see how they're recovering uh, with their biomass. This is a picture of me uh, when Bakes was letting me sit in his seat. Of course, I've got the flight plan in my hand. It was interesting as a first-time flyer to uh, realize that uh, a day-night cycle does not define the normal day anymore. And uh, with the flight plan, we use that as, of course, the coordinating document for all our activities, including our secondary experiments. And literally, the only thing that defined your day-to-day -day existence was that flight plan and the MET clock. This is a picture of Denver. And if you look carefully down here, if I can get this to work, that's the new airport, uh, nicknamed the Land of Lost Luggage. <laughs> this is Denver, and we showed this up here in the mountains above Denver. It's where the Great Plains meet the front range of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, we had a map site up there. There were 28 of the maps, and the maps in this case, of course, is the measurement of air pollution from satellites. This is a picture we were lucky to get. Usually the light levels down uh, this far south were too low, but uh, fortunately we managed to get it. This is actually the country of Chile, and this is at the southern tip of South America, and what you're looking at here are a couple of glaciers. And I think our TV people are going to highlight this for the, the folks on video. Here's one of the glaciers here and another one um, uh, right down here. If you look carefully in the water, you'll see the icebergs actually being uh, uh, flaked off the inner calve off of these glaciers into the water. These glaciers also have uh, these dark streaks through them, and that's boulders that have been entrained inside the, uh, the glaciers as they move down the mountains. We study glaciers because we think we can uh, detect movement, whether they're receding or progressing, and we, we believe this to be an uh, important indicator of uh, global climate change. This is the Panama Canal. This is Panama City, and the canal traces a path right through here. Notice the dark vegetation areas on either side of the canal. Uh, this is actually protre protected vegetation or uh, woodlands. And one of the things we're worried about in Panama is encroaching development with uh, Panama City right here. We're worried that, uh, well, these are protected forests right now. But if they do develop in there and they log or harvest this timber, then the heavy rains that they receive in this area will flood down into the canal. And they'll actually fill it up with silt, and the canal will be useless. It's uh, a perfect example of short-sighted uh, on, with a lot of human activities, if you fill up the canal with silt, obviously the country would lose a lot of, uh, of uh, its input there in money and capital. 
Also, the Smithsonian has a, a biological preserve located right in here, which is another reason to protect this area. This is a picture of the Sahara Desert. These are called the Tiffernine Dunes, and uh, it's difficult to see in this picture, but uh, there are a lot of sand dunes in there, and scientists actually get a lot of information on wind currents from the direction and the shape of these dunes. And also, as stated previously, uh, we imaged a lot of our, our targets and sites were in the Sahara Desert because we we're imaging the subsurface drainage patterns uh, from when the Sahara was a lot wetter place than it is now. Well, it's time to uh, tuck the red team into bed. And uh, here's a shot of three of the four bunks that, that we fly. Um, the, bunks, the bunks are really nice. Uh, they provide some sound insulation for us, uh, as well as a place to, to display uh, some of your banners. Uh, some of the better banners come a little bit later in the flight. <laughs> but um, anyways, these bunks, uh, uh, we did get to take some pictures here. These pictures are kind of unique in that they were backlit by some uh, slave flashes that uh, we have several uh, photo TV people that help us uh, train for taking all these photos, and we appreciate all your hard work. Next slide. And uh, here's a chart that was uh, uh, helped us out. We need, uh, needed a more detailed map to help us uh, find some of these uh, radar uh, targets. And uh, through the help of JPL and the flight data file people here at JSC, uh, we developed these uh, charts. And it was kind of like uh, if anybody's familiar with a trip tick, when you go on a, on a, uh, uh, a trip through the US area, you can, you can find your orbit and find where you are. Well, this is what happens when you put a uh, B-52 pilot and an A-6 bombardier navigator on the same shift. You argue about where you are. <laughs> but. Um, Actually, I was just, uh, we were trying to point out uh, what would happen in the next orbit, but uh, <coughs> <laughs> um, anyways, it, uh, again, we worked in two shifts, uh, and this is uh, Tom, myself, on the, on the blue shift with uh, Steve uh, taking this picture for us, and uh, the charts really helped us out. Next slide. Well, back to our uh, most spectacular uh, probably site that we saw on the mission, the, the eruption of uh, Khrushchevskoy. On, on the blue shift, we were lucky enough to see this for about the first four or five days of the mission. Uh, this was our morning uh, part of our work day coming over Kamchatka in northern Asia. So here you see a nice shot uh, of the plume blowing well out to the east into the Pacific Ocean, uh, pointing out all the ash and smoke coming from that single eruption. Uh, the Companion Mountains were also erupting, and you'll see that in the next uh, close-up picture. This is Khrushchevskoy in full eruption. This is the mountain of Khrushchevskoy itself. The eruptive vent was on the northeast flank of the volcano here in the shadow. And down uh, to the south a little bit is Bezimiani, another volcano that was building a little lava dome. And there was some steam coming off of that plume, as, uh, off of that mountain as well. And this was just a magnificent sight to watch this plume evolving day to day in the mission. And we turned the radar on this with some quick replanning on the ground science team's part and captured some good data about how a mountain actually changes during an eruption. Later in the flight, uh, the eruption, eruption calmed down, and the actual outgassing stopped. But the mountain itself here is all covered with that dark ash that uh, was coming out of the mountain a few days earlier. And then later, as you saw in the film, snow covered the entire scene and uh, made this a brand new area again. But here's uh, Klutchevskoy and Bezumiani to the south. This um, uh, dormant volcano up here is called Shivaluk, another target for the radar. Next slide. As uh, Terry mentioned earlier with the uh, film, we do receive messages every morning on our fax machine. This is our fax machine right here, basically, and I'm turning the, changing the paper out. Uh, often when you look at a picture from the space shuttle, I encourage you to take time to kind of look at and see what else you see in the background, and um, you can learn something from that. You'll notice I'm wearing two watches. We, most of us wore two watches so that we could keep track not only of the mission elapsed time, but also what time it was back in Houston. Uh, on my right wrist, you've seen this device also on Dan's left wrist. It's one of our medical experiments on board. Uh, through this little prism right here, it's actually measuring the light levels that we were exposed to and recording that within the silver box. And within the silver box, there was also accelerometers measuring our activity levels, uh, particu particularly our activity levels while we're sleeping to, make, to measure our quality of our sleep. Uh, this experiment was designed basically to study how well the blue shift, uh, who we actually were working basically from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. local time, how well we were sleep shifted. Also on the back, you'll see one of... Uh, a little yellow package there. That's one of the tasty cakes that Tom brought from his uh, Philadelphia uh, roots. Next slide, please. 
As uh, we mentioned in the film, we did change out one of the payload uh, high rate recorders. It was uh, very easy to do. We had thought it would take about two hours and ended up taking us about an hour and a half. Jeff and I had made a specific uh, trip to the Kennedy Space Center to practice uh, this in-flight maintenance procedure in case it uh, occurred and that turned out to be a very valuable trip. It just speaks volumes for the preparation that we had before the flight and we'd like to thank all the folks who helped us in all aspects of training in order to prepare for the flight. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned before, the blue team saw basically from Europe all the way through New Zealand. This is a picture of Australia, the eastern coast just uh, south of Cape York. One of the things that has been happening in Australia in recent months is a terrible drought and several fires have been started by the very few thunderstorms they do get and lightning striking the trees. So much of Australia was suffering unfortunately from these natural fires. The uh, other interesting thing about the fires we saw is that I recall one of our experiments was measuring carbon monoxide in the atmosphere. That was the measurement of air pollution from satellites experiment or MAPS. So every time we saw a fire we reported that so that the scientists would know that a producer of CO, which are the fires produce CO, uh, was at our location and uh, they were able to analyze the data and sure enough the data showed that there was higher CO levels here. So fires are a big produ producer of CO in the world and we noted them wherever we saw them. Next slide please. What we uh, have here in the picture right here on the left side of the screen for those of you at home is Mount Pinatubo. So this is the island of Luzon in the Philippines. You'll recall back in June of 1991, we had a, a terrible volcanic eruption in this area, displacing many families, and uh, also Clark Air Force Base, the United States installation right here. You can look real close. You can see the runways was displaced. Um, in this photo, what you see here, just let me orient you first of all. This is what is called Subic Bay on the west coast of Luzon. This is Manila Bay, excuse me, right down here. And from uh, military history, this is the Bataan Peninsula you may have heard of. Uh, Manila City is right here just peeking out from underneath these clouds at the uh, tip of the bay here. Now if you'll go back to Pinatubo, again the crater is right here and what you'll notice interrupting all this nice green and brown natural color are these uh, very light colored flows and what those are are where mud and ash has been washed down from the very sleep, steep slopes of Pinatubo and actually destroyed vegetation and in many cases uh, communities uh, with this mud flow and we call these lahars. Now, uh, the eruption itself also, as we know, had uh, a major climate uh, impact around the world and, of course, displaced many people here. If we'll go to the next slide now. Now this um, are two images from the Space Radar Lab. The image on the left is from STS-59. The image on the right is from our flight, STS-68. So about five months have passed between these two flights. First, let's look at uh, one of the images. Let's look at the image on the left. This is what we can produce using the radar. Uh, it basically it uh, shows the different elevations. You see the different colors here. This orange you see here is actually ash that's come from the crater right here. And so using the radar, you can get a real-time image of what uh, is happening uh, in any part of the world. Of course, it doesn't matter what the weather is. Now, it also, with the radar, you can take an image from one point in time and compare it with an image from another point in time and compare the differences. In this case, in this five months, and in particular three weeks before our flight, uh, the Philippines were hit with some very dramatic monsoons. Their 1994 mo monsoon season hit. And that, those monsoons carried large amounts of dirt and ash down these lahars. And 80,000 people were displaced in that short amount of time by all this rainfall, rainfall and the ensuing mud flows. If you look at this lahar right here, this mud flow right here, it's a fairly thin black line. Well, five months later, you can see how dramatically it's increased in size. So again, the radar can tell you something real time about what's going on and then you can compare for uh, changes over time. Next slide, please. Well, here we are again at the uh, roof of the world, as the Tibetan Plateau is called. Again, the dramatic lakes in this area uh, alternating with the, the peaks. Again, the minimum altitude in this area is usually around 15 or 20,000 feet. This is Yamzo Yunko is the name of this lake. Uh, also, I'd like you to look at the Brahmaputra River here. And notice how it meanders through the valley here. It's a very interesting ribbon effect that's uh, visually spectacular. I'd also like to point out that on this tributary, right up here in the upper left-hand corner of the picture, for those of you at home, is a city called Lhasa. And it's the traditional hometown for uh, the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan culture. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture looking from China and a desert in China called the Taklamakan. That's right here. South all the way to India. So in between the Taklamakan Desert here, where of course it's sand and very dry, 
You go through the Tibetan plateau here, 15, 20,000 foot uh, valleys, and the peaks get up in the 20, 25, 28,000 foot area. Through uh, Kashmir, on the right side of the screen here, some places you've heard about, uh, Nepal, and over here is the kingdom of Bhutan, all the way through to India. We uh, studied several sites in this area for geographical reasons. Again, under the sand here are potential old river drainages, things like that to look at. Uh, another interesting cultural aspect of this is right along the face of the mountains here is something called the Silk Trail. And, and in uh, centuries ago, that's how China shipped things like silk and spices to the east, excuse me, to the west, to Europe, uh, just along this path right here. And Europe returned goods, things like armor, uh, jewels, uh, things like that. And every 50 or 100 miles along this Silk Trail, you'd have a little trading outpost. And that's how things slowly worked their way across here. Uh, as a side benefit to our study, because the radar can look beneath the, stand, the sand, we might potentially see some kind of trails here or some um, evidence of these stations that were placed along the Silk Trail. Next slide. Well, here I am uh, looking up at Earth. You know, you always get the question, what's it look like to look down at our planet? Well, there is no real up or down when you're up there. And uh, here I am using one of the many uh, cameras out, out in overhead windows. Next slide. Um, this is a early morning shot of Moscow. Um, uh, we knew if we were passing over Moscow, it must be uh, early in, in the blue shifts um, uh, time up. But uh, I'll try to point out some of the things um, in the picture. Um, I don't know if we can work on the focus on that shot or not. But uh, right in the center there is, is the Kremlin. Uh, up in this area, which several people in the audience right now have been uh, before and may be going in the future, uh, and we have many folks from JSC that are there right now, is Star City, um, where the Russian cosmonauts uh, train. Uh, they actually, there's a complex uh, not too far from this large runway uh, where they actually do most of their training. Um, their large uh, international airport is uh, right, right here. This photograph is, is oriented uh, with north at, at the top. Uh, this city, uh, Moscow, is interesting. This part of the world people have inhabited for 2,000 years. Uh, Moscow itself is uh, 750 years old, and uh, this is a home to 8 million people, uh, quite a large city. Um, next slide, please. This is in uh, China, in an area called Alishan. Was a, uh, this was a, a uh, um, desertification uh, site. We're interest, this is an area where they actually irrigate. Um, and this is the Yellow River here, its height highlighted in uh, sun glint, as you can see. Um, uh, we call it the Yellow River in China. It's known as the uh, Huang Ho. And actually, we were trying to get uh, several shots of this area because we were told that the, uh, the Great Wall of China uh, intersects right about uh, in here. And it's off the bottom of the slide, unfortunately. But there's another area. So uh, we're s still uh, taking a good hard look at this uh, shot. Uh, the Great Wall ran along the mountain front in an effort to, uh, to keep out the Mongol invaders. Next slide. This is a 250-millimeter uh, shot of the Everest, Mount Everest region, the highest point in the world. Um, Mount Everest is right there in the middle of the shot. Uh, I wish we had some audio going when we, when we went over Everest because uh, we just, just about went crazy, everybody t uh, with about four cameras in each hand trying to take pictures. Um, the way we find Mount Everest, this shot is looking uh, mostly to the south. There's uh, irrigation towards the bottom of the photo, which kind of turns into a V. And then we know uh, if you look along the uh, eastern V, at the end of it is Mount Everest. And that's how we found it there. The elevation of Mount Everest is uh, about 29,000 feet, so almost uh, um, uh, five statute miles. Our elevation was about, uh, uh, or almost, uh, I guess, five nautical miles. Our elevation, or our orbit, was 115 nautical miles. So uh, that's the closest that we ever got to the Earth right there when we were actually in orbit. Uh, the next highest peak is called K2. It's uh, located uh, to the west, and its, um, uh, its elevation is just over 28,000 feet, also in the Himalayas. There was a hydrology site here called uh, Kumba Himalaya that was uh, not too far away, which we're interested in as well. Next shot. 
And uh, after the blue shift is done, of course, it's our turn to get into the bunks. And uh, there you see um, a picture of, of part of my family there. And, and as I said before, some of the better banners that would uh, come out. Um, and uh, again, you see the actalooms that we had to wear uh, throughout the flight. And it's kind of funny. I've, uh, my daughter is seven weeks old, and I've noticed some of the things that, that a uh, small baby does. And one of them is the reflex. And, and both Steve and I had uh, kind of a, when we were falling asleep, we had some reflexes uh, every so often, you know, where you kind of get startled. And uh, so we, uh, in the beginning of our sleep period, usually kept each other up by having a reflex and, and banging the side of the bunks here and keeping each other up. Next slide. This is a shot of the uh, Arroyo Australia uh, Southern Lights. It's really quite incredible to me. One of the most spectacular things that we got to see on the flight, being high inclination, we got far, far enough south to be able to see this. In the redshift, got to see the uh, lights about on three revs just south of Australia. Really incredible things to see. You can see the entire, um, at, at least on one rev, the entire uh, magnetic pole, and you can see. Um, point out some more features here. You can see the the Earth's limb right here, the top of the atmosphere up here, and you can see the lights extending up way above that. And in fact, on some of the resin, we actually went through or appeared to go through the the lights. And then, of course, one of my favorite things to see on orbit are sunsets and sunrises. And you know, they occur about every 45 minutes, and uh, just fantastic, beautiful blues that you can see here. Yeah. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close our little slideshow.